Good day, good night, and welcome to Soccer Today magazine. I'm Kev Laramie, and today we'll be breaking down Belgium and Canada from a statistical point of view. And of course, we will look at the starting 11 and break down all the results from Group F. But this is just one part of the show today on this extensive, exhaustive game day one breakdown we'll look at every single game of match day one in the world cup we'll also break down every single group from top to bottom and what's at stakes for the second match we'll also talk about ronaldo going into history we'll have a couple of different segments on the beautiful game over the last couple of weeks but it's going to be a very in-depth show we'll talk about john herdman davies penalty miss we'll break down of course also my top five after game one, at the end of the show, I'll give you my top five favorites to win the World Cup based on eye tests, statistical tests, and of course, how they looked and how they played in game day one or two, depending on which team. But as we start this game, I think it's important to remind ourselves of the overall gameplay and the overall feel of seeing Canada at the World Cup for the first time. Well, in my lifetime, being 38 years old, I was two in 1986. I do not remember Canada and Mexico 86, but let's look at Belgium, Canada. Let's break down right now. one nothing. It was a one nothing loss for Canada, still looking for its first ever goal at the World Cup. Belgium, Canada took place on November 23rd at Ahmed Ben Ali Stadium, known as the Al Rayyan Stadium also. Here are what I want to highlight from these numbers. 22 shots for Canada. Only three on target, which is the same as Belgium, but 22 shots. Now, expected goals varies depending on which website, which data aggregator you take it from. This is from a well-known source. 2.63 is a consensus. Some places have 3.2 or something. I will go with 263. And to me, that's a big number. And the scoreline should have been different. Chances for crosses 16. Another indicator of the pressure Canada was putting on Belgium is the clearances here. 27 clearances by Belgium. That is a whole lot. And that is a lot of clearance for Belgium to do. Canada was able to put pressure and find ways to put Belgium in trouble. But it wasn't enough couple of missed chances couple of well one missed penalty will get there but according to my own calculations chances for for canada those are not just the big chances those are scoring chances pure scoring chances four for canada one for belgium and they took advantage of it the one moment of madness for canada and brilliance for belgium let's look at the players that started the game for Canada. It was a different starting 11 anticipated. My preferred 11 was a bit different. Junior Hullet was not there. You had Sam Adikube instead of Alfonso Davies and Alfonso Davies higher, which I think we will see my preferred 11 on Sunday versus Croatia. Davies a little higher up top next to David. Buchanan maybe back in the middle, but Richie Larea did play very well at that spot. It'll be interesting to see how they manage that situation. You want to find a place, probably for Kyle Lahren on the starting 11 against Croatia, having a attacking three of Davies, David, and Lahren, or Davies, Lahren, and David, and having Buchanan maybe on the bench for this one could make sense. But this was a starting 11 against Belgium. Let's start with the goalkeepers and make our way forward. Matt Borjan, the legend. Gray sweatpants himself was in net against Belgium. Kamal Miller, Steven Vittoria, and Alistair Johnston were your three men back line. Alistair Johnston linked with Celtic in Europe, in Scotland, the biggest team in Scotland. I'm sorry, Rangers fans, if you're listening, Celtic is the biggest team in Scotland. Alfonso Davies, Ostakio, Hutchinson, and Larea. That's where the surprises were to see Alfonso Davies at this position. I kind of enjoyed having him a little higher up top, uh, but this does make sense to have the overlap possibilities with Horlat on that side. And the three strikers that were playing against Belgium, you had Junior Horlat, Jonathan David, and Tejan Buchanan. We will break down Jonathan David's game a little later when we talk about the David Davies penalty controversy, if there is a controversy. We will talk about that in just a second as we now continue to look at 
the starting 11 for Belgium this time against Canada. Because let's not forget, this is Group F. We will probably need to have results from other players, other teams here to help Canada move on. Thibaut Courtois, best goalkeeper in net, was goalie for Belgium. Vertogen, Ardel Wereld, and Lyndon Docker. Lyndon Docker? Were your backline, Carrasco, Vissel, Tillemans, and Castang. Were your midfield. And for the strikers, for Belgium, you had Eden Hazard, Matt Bachuayi, Bachuayi, who of course, Michi Bachuayi, who's taken over for Romelu Lukaku, injured. We'll miss the first two games for sure. Hopefully, he'll be back for the last game in the group stage for Belgium or not. Bachuayi scored and Kevin De Bruyne. Speaking of Kevin De Bruyne, we'll break down his numbers in just a minute. Well, why not just go there right now? Let's talk about Kevin De Bruyne as we're talking about Belgium and how, well, I was impressed by how Canada was able to muzzle him. Look at these numbers. Ain't nothing impressive here by maybe the best midfielder in the entire world. 90 minutes played, 71% passing accuracy, nothing too great there. Expected assists. That's very low for Kevin De Bruyne. Usually he has 0 0.5, 0 0.6, if not higher, per game with Manchester City, even with the national team. Here, 0 0.26 expected assist. Terrible game for Kevin De Bruyne from that perspective. X goal and expected assist, 0 0.37. Means he will only have influence on a game every three games for a goal that is not Kevin De Bruyne numbers. Two shots, one on target, six crosses, and four key passes. But those numbers are not indicative of a great game. Those numbers tell me that Canada was able to stifle Belgium. And that is important because we're going to have Croatia up next and Canada will need to stifle the midfield. They'll need to stifle Modric. They'll need to stifle the attacking Perisic and more. It might not be as hard as people anticipate. A lot of people think, and even some Canadian players have been talking about how Croatia might be better than Belgium. I don't think so. Croatia aged really quickly. They hit a wall. And yes, they've been playing well, but that wall will be very quickly coming when they play Canada on Sunday. And I have a feeling, yes, I have a feeling, that Canada will play very well against the old legs of Croatia. Maybe it's wishful thinking. But I do believe Canada has the upper hand against a team like Croatia that has a stale mentality, a stale tactical, well, awareness over the last couple of years. And I don't think that the success of Russia 2018 will, will have a correlation with the success in 2022. The world have changed a whole lot since then from multiple perspectives. And on the pitch, the players will have to say something about it. And I think Canada has a chance to upset Croatia literally outright by winning or at least getting a draw at least getting a goal and getting a draw and leaving it to December 1st against Morocco. We've talked about Jonathan David. We've talked about Alfonso Davies. Of course, we have seen, uh, well, there's a controversy with the penalty. There's a controversy with the fact that Alfonso Davies took it and let nobody else hit it. But to me... This should have been Jonathan David. And of course, it's easy to say after the fact, oh, the pure striker should have gone for it. But as a statistician, as a mathematics aficionado, penalties are a long-term game. It's not one, it's, it's a long-term. You need your striker to do it all the time. And over a period of time, you have a very high successful rate. And that's what's really necessary here. If I'm John Herdman, from now on, it's always Jonathan David. Even if he misses it, he's doing him. Because over a long stretch of time, over multiple penalties, you will have a higher percentage. You will have a high percentage of uh, success rate. And that's what counts when it comes to scoring goals. But if we look at Davies a bit more in, in detail and look at his entire game that he did have against Belgium. Because, yes, it was a good game, but... It wasn't necessarily perfect. Let's take a look. So here are his numbers against Belgium. 90 minutes played, passing accuracy 81%. 0.79 expected goals, very high, very good. X goals and expected assists of 0.91, which is almost one, which is almost a goal, which he almost influenced by himself, the creation of an entire goal. Duels won 27%, that needs to be better, it needs to be higher. If he is working and playing as a left wing back or left midfielder, 
this needs to be a whole lot higher. If he is purely a striker instead of Jonathan Hoyle, of Junior Hoyle at next game, then that 27% ain't as bad. But if he's used as a left back or left wing back, his duels one percentage must be higher. Fouls, commi fouls committed three, key passes three. Here, the important aspect, he's on a yellow card already. One more yellow card for Alfonso Davies will mean that he will be missing the next game. So Alfonso Davies needs to either get a yellow against Croatia and then miss Morocco or have to manage his playing style. And that is not good news heading into a game against Croatia where he might be needed to defend and track back and then you can easily get a second yellow. That's not ideal. So a lot of people were wanted to compare the two numbers, compare the two players. So let's do just that. Let's compare their first game. We've seen Alfonso Davies. We've seen the numbers. Let's now look at Jonathan David. Here are the numbers for Jonathan David. 90 minutes, 67%. 1.03 expected goals as much as we talk about Alfonso Davies missed penalty and how that could have changed the game regardless of that Jonathan David should have scored Jonathan David's game was good but zero shots on target after seven attempts on goal that is not good enough you need to be better defensive pressure applied he finished first of the entire game with 66 times he put pressure on defense that's a lot with the ball that's a lot. He had a great game, but he couldn't finish. Was he nervous? Was it the same thing for Davies? That's hard to tell. But these numbers do not lie. Seven shots, zero on target, expected goals of 1.03. It should have been better. It should have been a goal. Regardless of Davies' penalty, Jonathan David should have scored. When you have one and over expected goal at a World Cup level, when you're a top striker in the world, you need to bury yes. You need to bury almost every single opportunities you get. Because if not, well, one more opportunity on the other side like Belgium showed us. And you see Canada with a big disparity. And it comes to the score and they lost 1-0. We've talked about the starting 11. We've talked about Davies and David. And there's a chance Lyron starts the next game. But when I look at the bench and when I look at the possible influence of players on this team later in the game. I find that there's, yes, a lot of offensive possibility when you have Kyle Lyon on the bench, as we've seen here. Ismael Kone was used very well. We'll see if Mark Anthony K is used in the next game. Sam Adekube, will he start on? But the attacking options are really far and few between on the bench, to be quite fair. So if Kyle Lyon starts, Oilet has to be on the bench. Is Oilet your offensive off-the-bench contribution? That's the question. And that's what I'm asking. As much as we love Canada, we love the starting 11, we have to be pragmatic here. The bench is not our friend. We do not have a ton of attacking power on the bench. And this decision for the starting 11 will make a big difference versus the result of the game. And now you're going to have fatigue. You're going to have all these things coming into play for the second game. And we'll see if the bench can be used a bit better by John Herdman. But let's face it. The bench is very full with bodies, but still very thin when it comes to attacking experience at the high level. We've talked about John Herdman, and John Herdman has been making headlines across the world over the last couple of days. Let's look at what actually what he said. <laughs> I just told them they belong here, and we're going to go and F Croatia. Next, it's as simple as that. And of course, Croatia has run with it. Headlines across the world saying, oh, it's disrespectful, it's all that. Who's been talking about Davies' penalty since the last two days? In the famous world of Mel Lastman. Nobody! Because John Herdman has decided to put the onus of controversy on his own shoulders. Diverting the attention that Alfonso Davies would have gotten and putting him on him. Of course, he was asked, Ah, oh, was this on purpose, John? Did you do this on purpose? Just a spur of the moment. And the pragmatical leader, Don Herdman, is answered, Of course, it was a spur of the moment. But breaking it down now, this feels like a... Yes, it was thought of on the spur of the moment with the result of the game. But it was a, ma a brilliant way to divert attention and to put it all on him. 
he can take it he can take the criticism and he can be that shield john herdman the shield for his top players top star able to give a little bit of shadow under the bright sunlight of the world cup to alfonso davies giving him time to recoup recover and rinse and repeat for game number two jonathan david as well no real i would say negative feelings when it comes to this game are lingering because canada's brave they caught the headlines everywhere and they could do better but of course john herman has decided to die de deflect the attention put it on him and you know what it might be what canada needed we'll know more on sunday when we look at what it means but with that result and of course we know who is where in group f let's look at the standings in group f after of course, Croatia and Morocco. It was a nil-nil draw between Croatia and Morocco. And Mor Morocco and Croatia. Moesha and Croaco. That sounds like a really good uh, TV show. Moesha and Croaco. Here are your Group F standings. Top of the group is Belgium, Croatia second, Morocco third, and Canada fourth. Right now with a minus one differential. We've talked about Morocco and Croatia. We can look right now. Well, if there's you want to look at potential scenarios for Canada here. Okay. Canada wins against Croatia. Canada has three points. Morocco loses to Belgium. Belgium's got six. Then second is Canada. And you have Morocco and Croatia. So there, there's a way to be top two after just Sunday night. We'll know more when it comes down to break that down. But let's look at this Morocco-Croatia game because this was maybe the most... Well, fruitless game of the entire group stage so far. You had uh, eight shots, two on target for Morocco, five and two for Croatia. Nothing dangerous came from Croatia there. Nothing dangerous really came from Morocco either. 35% possession, but Morocco did look good in a way. 65% possession for Croatia. Passing accuracy, 78 to 85. 16 fouls, 11 for Croatia. Corners, five for Croatia, zero for Morocco. Brozovic did run for 12.48 kilometers in this game. 121 passes for Guardiol. Yes, 70 sprint for Nisiri. And a yellow card for, for Amrabat, who will be suspended if he gets another yellow in this game competition let's look at the starting 11 of croatia for that game as we get ready for the one on sunday versus canada i expect a very similar starting 11 for croatia on sunday modric of course perisic kramaric vlasic anybody that finishes itch will be there also sosak vardio lovren and juranovic maybe you will have some defensive substitutions maybe one sosa might not be playing in the next game we will know more on sunday when we have the lineup of croatia now morocco morocco's lineup versus croatia uh, sofian bufal a name to keep in mind and the siri also he is their best striker hakim ziek who has been rumored to go to ac milan is also top as you're attacking right Striker. Mazraoui, Saez, Agard, and Akimi were your backline. Bono and Net, no, not Bono of U2 and not Bono of TFC. It's just another Bono. Amala, Amrabat, and Hunahi were your midfield for Morocco. But that's not just what I want to talk about. I also want to bring you to Luka Modric's match because to me, Luka Modric is a very important player for this team and we will see here his numbers against morocco nothing impressive to be quite honest yes 90 percent passing accuracy 107 touches 77 pass completed four crosses completed three long balls well long balls could be a problem we saw canada had difficulties handling them so maybe that will be a problem against canada ground duels one three interceptions three aerial duels one a way to be Croatia will be to maybe put the ball in the air and use <laughs> the height of Canadians versus the, the smaller height of Croatians, if that is possible. But that is what's to come. That is the next opponent for Canada is Croatia as we transport ourselves to Sunday at Khalifa International Stadium, 11 a.m. Eastern, Canada, Croatia for maybe the second spot in Group F. That could be really fun and that could happen really quickly 
we'll take a short break when we come back we will break down all the results in all the games from group one well game one and game two we will also break down all the group standings we'll talk about ronaldo at the world cup he is of course now in history of being the first male player to score at five straight world cups and we will also look at my top five teams after game one my favorites to win the tournament after this short break back on Soccer Today Magazine. I'm Kev Laramie. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening to this beautiful podcast. If you want to reach myself and maybe book me on your show, on your TV show. I've been on CTV News Channel a whole lot lately. Been doing radio hits across the country from coast to coast. And you can reach me at KevinOnSoccer at gmail.com. It is time to look at the different scores across group A to F to G. Heading into this amazing World Cup that we're all on, let's look at some of the results that we have seen after Game 1. So we'll go back to the first game, of course, Qatar-Ecuador. Ecuador won their second game too. What an impressive team so far. England won 6-2, then 0-0 in the second game against USA. Senegal, Netherlands. Netherlands had beat Senegal 2-0 in the first game. And they were not impressive in the second, but they impressed me enough in the first one to, to be in my top five. Spoiler, we'll look at it later. USA, Wales, and you see all the results here. The biggest upsets I want to talk about, of course, is Saudi Arabia, Argentina. They're playing Poland in the second game, so we'll see how they fare against Poland for Saudi Arabia. But they can get out of the group maybe for the second time only in their history. Saudi Arabia is really the upset of the tournament so far against Argentina. Another upset to me, well, it was really a big upset is Japan Germany big victory for Japan coming from behind they were one goal down and they beat 2-1 and by the famous rule of three Canada beat Japan in a friendly before the World Cup so Canada is better than Germany because Japan is better than Germany so that's the famous rule of three Spain 7 Costa Rica 0 that was quite a, quite a result Switzerland being professional against Cameroon 1-0 Uruguay Korea, South Korea 0-0 Portugal Ghana was 3-2 Portugal did not look that great, though. Uh, I'll be quite honest with you. They looked like the good offense, but they also looked like a very porous defense. Brazil looked amazing. It could have been 10-0 against Serbia. And to me, they are a team that looked amazingly well-run, well-oiled. The well-oiled machine, the Yoga Bonito, as they will be looking to win a record six World Cup this time around. Here are some of the games from Group Stage Match 2 that have already taken place yesterday was Wales-Iran. Big win for Iran 2-0. I am rooting for Iran. Qatar, Senegal, especially what's going on in the country, it's fun to see the players rally behind the people. Senegal 3, Qatar 1. Qatar is eliminated. First team ever to be eliminated. First host team ever to be eliminated after two games of the World Cup. Netherlands-Ecuador 1-1. Big surprise by the Netherlands. In Ecuador, Ecuador played really well. They will be coming out of the group and are a favorite to continue their run. England, USA on nil nil draw. You can catch my TV hit on CTV News on my social media if you want to have my more of my thoughts on that game. And you can see the rest of the games for group stage match day two as we now move on to the groups. And we will look at some of the results in group A to start. So after two games, the Netherlands are top of Group A with four points, a goal differential of two identical numbers for Netherlands and Ecuador. Senegal third. They could technically still qualify, but it's not looking too good for Senegal, unfortunately. And Qatar fourth, already eliminated from this tournament. Let's move on to Group B as we look at the standings in Group B after game number two. Two games played, England still top of the group with four points, having won one and draw one. Six goals for, two goals against, a differential of four. Iran is second of the group 
with three points, one win, and one loss. They have four goals scored, six goals against minus two. USA are third, but USA will play Iran. If USA beats Iran, USA will have five points and will guarantee a place out of the group. The UN, the United States of America does hold their destiny in their hands. And Wales are very close to being eliminated. Anything else than a win will spell the end of Wales at this World Cup. Let's now look at Group C. Group C, Saudi Arabia, Poland, Mexico, Argentina. Games are taking place Saturday for this group. But after game number one, Saudi Arabia was top. Poland, second, Mexico, third, and Argentina, fourth. But it's not going to be over for Argentina. I have a little bit of an inkling that they'll perform well in their next two games and maybe even win the group. It's not over yet. But Argentina definitely under pressure after game number one. As we move to Group D, Group D, France, Tunisia, Denmark, and Australia. Australia did get a win earlier today, so they do have three points now. But uh, this is uh, the graphic was made before the end of that game, so you can see this after game number one is your Group D standings with France, Tunisia, Denmark, and Australia after game number one. Let's move now to Group E. Yes, Group E. I really like Group E. Spain might be my favorite team in the whole tournament so far. How they've been playing that game was impressive. The best differential in the tournament so far. Spain, Japan, Germany, Costa Rica. It's going to be a top seed derby group. Germany will try to, well, at least save face and maybe qualify and get out of the group. But Japan are impressive. Spain are, I don't see them finishing outside the first of the group, so... It'll be an uphill battle for Germany. It's going to be between Japan and Germany. And who knows if Japan J Japan might be coming out of this group. Let's continue our look at the standings here. Group G, Brazil. Amazing performance. Switzerland, second. Cameroon and Serbia. That is your group G. And then the group H. Let's finish the group standings with group H. Portugal. They've looked. All right. Uh, I don't think they look that good, honestly. Ghana was able to score a couple. And that's very interesting. But the one thing that's important and fun here is looking at Portugal. While Ronaldo scored from the penalty spot. For a fifth straight World Cup, Cristiano Ronaldo has scored. And Cristiano Ronaldo has become the fifth man. No, sorry. The first man in the world to score at five straight World Cup. A couple other players, Marta of Brazil, done it on the women's side, and Christine St. Clair have also done it from the women's side. But when we look on the men's side, it's the first time a man does it, and it's Cristiano Ronaldo doing it. And let's look at Cristiano Ronaldo and his history at the World Cup. So he scored eight goals with the one he did against Ghana in history. At the FIFA World Cup. His first World Cup was in 2006 in Germany. And he scored against Iran in South Africa in 2010. He scored against North Korea in the group stage. Brazil 2014, he scored against Ghana. So that's his first goal against Ghana before the one earlier this week. And then the one game in Russia 2018 against Spain where he scored three goals, of course, has propelled him to the, 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 the amazing record that you see here and against Morocco also he scored in Russia 2018 and in Qatar against Ghana that's eight goals in 18 appearances for Cristiano Ronaldo at five straight World Cup and once again the first player first male player in history to score at five different World Cup and this brings me to the pièce de résistance the main event the main dish the dish of the night, the entree, my top five. Heading into game number two. These are my favorite team to raise the trophy to stand in the confettis in just a few weeks. No surprise here, Spain is my top team after game one. Brazil is second. They look great. Hopefully they can play well still without Neymar who will be missing the next game. Maybe even the third one with an ankle injury. England third. Yes, they did not impress me though in their second game, but this was done after the first. So they're still there. And to me, the three Lions can still get something out of this beautiful game. 
France. Especially because England's going to play well. So it's going to be very fun to finish a group. France will be very impressive once again. 4-1 without really playing well. France could be the first team in a while to win it back-to-back. And the Netherlands. I was impressed by the Netherlands. A well-managed team that is going to grow. And yes, 1-1 wasn't the best result in Game 2. But I think this Netherlands team can be dangerous. And that's why I have them at that spot because I think they can be a very dangerous team in the end of this World Cup. I hope you enjoyed this show, Soccer Today Magazine. You can subscribe everywhere you find your favorite podcast. And of course, you can subscribe to our YouTube page. It really helps me out with the algorithm and we're trying to grow the channel. We're almost at a thousand subscribers. And with your help, we can continue to do more and love and grow this beautiful show, Soccer Today and Soccer Today Magazine. Soccer Today Magazine is the video version, always available on YouTube. From time to time, I'll be more podcasts, but the, the daily podcast will not be a, necessarily possible with LB Baby Arthur, who has been in my life for a month now and is really bringing a whole lot of joy. But for now, you'll have this show and you can catch my thoughts on the World Cup in multiple platforms and medias. You can also contact me once again if you want to have me on your TV show or if you want to write to me, if you like what we do here at Soccer Today, if you like what I do here at Soccer Today, Kevin on Soccer at gmail.com. You can reach me there and you can subscribe on Twitter. You can subscribe anywhere you find your favorite podcast. And of course, until next time, as always, I'm Kev Laramie and I do wish you not only a great day and uh, have fun with your family and, of course, have fun with watching the World Cup, but I do wish you also a great soccer.